As you all know, over the uh, past few weeks, we have working, been working around the clock to address the impact of coronavirus in Georgia, making plans for the future, and giving timely updates to the public. I can assure you that we will continue to do that. We appreciate everyone who is heeding the guidance of federal, state, and local officials. Before I get into specific updates, I want to start off with this. All of you have seen that we're starting to have large event cancellations and school closures across the country. As a result, we're hearing from people in every region of Georgia asking us for advice. In many ways, our message continues to stay the same. We would like to ask people to continue to follow best practices of your health with regular hand washing, avoiding large, large events if you're sick, and once again, let, let me remind everyone that this information continues to be available through the CDC and the Department of Health. But here's where our message is changing. Elderly Georgians and those with chronic underlying health conditions face a much higher risk of adverse consequences from exposure to, to coronavirus. We must take extra care around elderly individuals, people with ongoing health issues, and those who have a suppressed immune system. We need to help them dramatically limit their exposure to the public for the foreseeable future. Health officials are not now telling us that these vulnerable populations need to avoid mass gatherings and locations with high traffic counts of people, even faith-based services or events. I've already had this conversation with my mother to keep her safe and plan how we can get her what she needs in the weeks ahead. We cannot be too cautious in this area, and I would urge you all to do the same. Starting as soon as possible, I'm calling on all families across Georgia to get together and talk about how they're going to protect their grandparents, how they're going to protect their loved ones with health conditions, and how they'll come up with a game plan for getting them what they need, groceries, prescriptions, and other necessary supplies. Last night, we announced that there were 31 confirmed and presumed positive cases of COVID-19 in 12 counties throughout our state. Today, it is with great sadness that we have to report the state's first patient death from COVID-19. The individual, a 67-year-old male, was hospitalized at Wellstar Kennestone, Kennestone since testing positive for COVID-19 on March the 7th. In addition to being infected with coronavirus, this individual had an underlying medical condition. Marty, the girls and I are continuing to be in prayer for this individual and, and his uh, or her loved one during this incredibly difficult time. I know that the medical professionals on site did everything that they could, and I greatly appreciate their efforts. Our hearts go out to his loved ones, friends, and the community. And we also pray, continue to pray for the safety of the health care providers across the state who are working hard on patient care. Out of the new confirmed cases, one individual is a resident of Lee County and is hospitalized. The source of the infection is unknown. One individual is a resident of Cobb County and is hospitalized. The individual has a history of travel outside the United States. One individual is from Floyd County and is also hospitalized. The source of the infection is unknown. And three of the newly confirmed cases of COVID-19 are residents of Bartow County. Two of those individuals are hospitalized and the sources of infection are unknown at this time. Based on our initial investigation, it seems that these cases may have had a connection to a local church in the Bartow County area. The third individual is not hospitalized, and while the source of the infection is unknown, this individual does share a connection with the individual from Floyd County that has been mentioned previously. The Georgia Department of uh, Public Health is also awaiting um, confirmatory testing from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on three new presumed positive cases of COVID-19. Two individuals are from DeKalb County. Both are hospitalized and the source of their infection is unknown. There is no connection between these two cases. The other two presumed, presumed positive cases involve a resident of Lowndes County and that individual is hospitalized. 
The source of the infection is unknown. As the number of cases continue to grow, we continue to closely communicate with our K-12 and higher education communities to ensure timely decision making for families as well as the stakeholders involved. The Georgia Department of Education, University System of Georgia, Technical College System, and local school leaders have been invaluable partners to determine the best measures to protect students, teachers, and administrators. For local school systems, we've already seen limited closures in specific areas to deal with the recent cases of coronavirus. We know that school closures have a major impact on our Georgia families. Given the rise of the coronavirus cases, along with the push for more school closures, I'm going to issue a call to action for community leaders, educational leaders, and child care providers across our state. If you feel that it is prudent, you should consider closing daycares, schools, or school districts as early as tomorrow through the next two weeks. In addition, county and local government should consider what closures might be appropriate, pr appropriate that do not affect essential services. I want to emphasize that this is not a mandate. At this point, we believe that local decision making is the right course of action and that you have the flexibility. Regardless of whether you stay open or decide to close, we will support that decision. At this time, I am not shutting down state government or the Georgia State Capitol. However, I am immediately suspending non-essential travel and implementing telework policies for most state employees because it's simply the right thing to do. This arrangement will prevent substantial disruption of services to our constituents but also help mitigate risk. We will be sending out guidance to all agency leaders shortly after this press conference to ensure that they have the right plans in place for implementation. Also, we'll issue directives to the Departments of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, Corrections, Juvenile Justice, and Veteran Services regarding visitation. Until April 10th, 2020, Department facilities will completely suspend visitation except for next of kin and end of life situations. This decision, as you can imagine, was not made lightly, but we must do what we need to do to keep our people safe. These populations are in close contact, some with underlying health conditions that if exposed to coronavirus could result in a serious medical problem or cause widespread infection. Yesterday, as you know, I sent a letter to Speaker David Ralston and Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan, who are standing with me today, to request $100 million in the revenue shortfall reserves to address the spread of COVID-19, ensuring that Georgia has the resources at hand to enable us to quickly and thoroughly prevent the spread of the virus within our borders, which is critical to keeping our citizens safe, maintaining our health network, and mitigating negative economic impact. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate their solid support and leadership on this issue. With their help, we will have more tools available to address our health needs in the weeks ahead. Given the quick rise of cases across our state, it is necessary to expand the task force reach and build working committees for detailed briefings and analysis. Today I'm announcing the creation of several new working committees to make sure that we're covering all of our bases for coronavirus here in our state. First, I'm creating the Emergency Preparedness Committee, which will be chaired by General John King, our state's insurance commissioner, with the mission of analyzing ava the availability of necessary supplies and evaluating all logistical needs that we may have. Their job is to continue thinking ahead, as we have all been doing for the last several weeks, but also laying the groundwork for supply chain needs and demand for critical services, including things that may not be on our radar at this moment. I also will be creating the Economic Impact Committee. It will be chaired by our state economist, Jeff Dorfman, to work with academia, business leaders, and lawmakers on determining both the short and long-term impacts of this virus on economic and financial sectors. I've asked Lieutenant Governor Duncan and Speaker Ralston or their designees to serve on this committee with us. 
I'm also creating a primary care physicians committee to be chaired by Dr. Ben Watson to make the best decisions for our health network and to have an open, open, consistent line of communication. We need to hear from and coordinate with medical experts who are familiar with providing frontline medical care. As you all know, Representative Watson or Dr. Watson is a veteran in this field and his committee's work will be critical in the days and weeks ahead. We will also be asking other lawmakers who are physicians to serve on this important committee. Lastly, I'm creating a committee to advocate for an especially vulnerable part of our state's population, our homeless community. The Committee for the Homeless and Displaced will be chaired by Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, who certainly understands the importance of this fight and knows what we need to, to do to ensure adequate shelter, resources, and care for these Georgians. In the days ahead, we will announce the full committee member list, and I'm looking forward to working with them as we continue to address this health challenge that our state and our families are facing. Before I turn it over to my counterparts, I'd like to leave everyone with a few important points. To address real world problems like we're facing today, I will be addressing some real world examples. There are numerous constituents who have raised concern with the state's decision to utilize Hard Labor Creek State Park for the isolation of specific patients fighting infection. Let me be clear, these are non-critical, stabilized patients who do not have a viable alternative for shelter. I will give you an example. Imagine a family with an infant and one parent who is sick with COVID-19. The parent who is sick cannot go home because it risks infecting the infant's only other caregiver. Neither of those scenarios is acceptable. We will continue to use Hard Labor Creek State Park because quite honestly, some people have no other choice. If your doctor or medical provider has recommended isolation or quarantine, it is critical for you to follow that advice to prevent the spread of this virus, even though you may not be experiencing symptoms. If you ignore this medical advice, you are literally endangering lives in our state. It is simply not worth it. Please, I, I beg you to please do as we are asking you to do. I want to thank President Trump and Vice President Pence for their leadership on fighting this across our country. They have empowered state and local leaders to take necessary action to keep our families safe. And they've been incredibly accessible as they continue to offer their assistance, but also heed our advice. I also want to thank everyone who's standing here with me today. I know these individuals have been putting in some very long hours and operating with very little sleep, but you would never know it. I'm grateful for, to this team. I want to thank everyone who's watching or listening and who may be sick with COVID-19 and have them realize that we are dealing with their, your fellow Georgians in this crisis. We must continue, as we are here today, to be united. They need our support, and we will continue to stay in this fight together. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Toomey, and she'll give you a quick update. Dr. Toomey. 